All right, you ready to roll up your sleeves? Yeah? They're rolled up. You're rolled up. Christy's ready. Okay. Um, I'm here at three purposes. The first is to introduce our simulator and roads that you're going to be using. Second, I really want to guide your thinking towards the root cause drivers of the climate and equity crisis, both towards what's causing it and what you can do about it. What are the high leverage actions that need to be taken to bend the curve on this challenge? From a systems thinking perspective, what's really driving change? Not get distracted by the flavor of the month, whatever's the hot thing that's in the headlines. And the third is to have, I guess, just stir the pot a little bit and help you be as fierce for results as I think you probably are. But when you're all together, you get to notice how fierce the results you are. So, you know what I mean by fierce for results? Anyone else want to see some results in the world? Yeah. yeah. You're going to spend your whole career working on stuff. Let's get some things done here. OK? We're going to use a simulator, En-ROADS. Uh, we built it with our colleagues at MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative. It's using a system dynamics model. Anyone here studied the field, modeling field of system dynamics before? Grew out of 1950s MIT. High order, non-linear differential equation models. Basically applied electrical engineering and control theory, but you'll see making it much more accessible in simulations that people actually use. The actual use is the mission of Climate Interactive, the nonprofit that I'm the executive director of, where uh, right now there are 500,000 people using the model. It's in 21 languages. We're proud that it is all around the world, but there are some moments that we're particularly proud of. One of them is that the earlier version of this model called Sea Roads, we gave to the Chinese government and the US government asked for a version of it. So in 2014, when they sat down to negotiate the bilateral US-China climate deal, they had the same model. They could agree about how the carbon cycle and emissions and temperature worked to the point that they could artfully disagree about many other things, but not the basics of the carbon cycle. And that set them up to come up with an agreement that set up the, the Paris Agreement. And then in this last couple of years, the uh, members of Congress, we met with 128 members of Congress using this simulator in settings like this or one-on-one -on -one to help figure out what are the important strategies here in the United States for addressing climate and equity. All right. So why we do this? I want to get away from models and stuff and get back to what matters to us as human beings. What a summer for climate. Tropical was... storm in California. Tropical... A tropical storm in California? What was that about? <laughs> so we heard the first one. A tropical storm in California. Five words or less. Call some out. Someone over here. Wildfire smoke. Wildfire smoke, wildfire up in Cali up in Canada, but all over. Another one, yes. Floods in Pakistan. Floods in Pakistan, a third of Pakistan underwater. What else? Yes. Heat waves in India. Yes, right here. Sea level, rise. sea level rise. What's a city that comes to mind when you get concerned about that? <laughs> the Netherlands, but it's a country, but it's you know it's okay. Sea levels. Yeah, the Netherlands. What was it when you said it? What came to mind for you, Wiley? Venice. 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 Netherlands. <laughs> Venice. Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Just keep calling them out. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. When I encourage you to be fierce for results, I really want to just get, this is what I'm talking about, okay? The fact that we're here gives us incredible privilege. With this great privilege of this education that you're getting, people watching this video, if you're even in school, not necessarily even Stanford, the, the privilege of getting an education and being safe in this way gives us that responsibility to be fierce for results, fight for results we really want to see. All right, so let's explore this. What does all of this look like in En-ROADS? Uh, you click on a title and you see impacts and you can see ocean acidification or many of these other results that you might be curious about. Uh, here, flood, the, our friends at Climate Central were kind enough to give us the link to their maps. So not just impacts like, I don't know, feeding people. Crop yield in the top left, 19% drop in maize by 2100, if things continue as they are. And one note, this is our baseline. This is not gonna happen, okay? This is not our forecast. This is not what we're saying is going to happen. This is if we just follow current policies, this is where things are headed. But it's not gonna happen because we all are gonna do so much better than that terrible situation would be if 90% drop in maize. Um, I haven't looked in Venice. You said Venice. So you type in here, you could go look with your group. Venice Beach? No. <laughs> this is not Barbie. Okay. Uh, so then you can go look and see, all right, you see the boot, there's the boot. What are we talking about? Areas that are blue in 2100 are at risk to sea level rise. 2060, and you can go look again, and then you can go see other areas. So this is a, a serious threat, boy, even in 17 years, 2040, yeah, 20, okay. Go look, get grounded in what really matters when it comes to impacts. Now, I'm gonna ask a lot of why questions. Why is this happening? Why is sea level rise happening? Just call out. Melting glaciers is a big part of it. It's secondary. Warm water is bigger. Warm water is bigger. Warm water is bigger. Why is water warm? Because of this trend. Temperature change, of course. This is where things are headed in this scenario where we are here at 1.2, 1.3, 1.5. We want to limit warming to that dotted line and or the, yeah, the second dotted line of two, not going up to 3.3. Why is that happening? And I'm, you notice I'm clicking up here. These are our favorite 12 graphs. There is greenhouse gas net emissions. The reason temperature is going up is because of the pollution. Climate change science is easy. There's this stuff called greenhouse gas net emissions. When it goes up, temperature goes up. This is the pollution. What's that blip right there? COVID, but it's coming back. Those emissions are coming back up. Now, when you see a scenario like this and you see a model like this, you think, how would they build confidence in a model like this? It seems to run really fast. Maybe it's pulling data from somebody else's model. No, it's starting in 1990 with initial conditions every 45 days, 5,000, 15,000? I gotta check that. <laughs> uh, equations are calculating every 45 days how this plays out through the next 110 years. But we have a lot of respect for the big integrated assessment models and the other models that other teams build and then they share their research and we compare against them. That's one of the ways that we build confidence. So when you see a graph like this, know that it's really important to say, hey, the other scientists on earth, what do they think is going to happen? With what they call implemented policies. You see that red line? This is the same time horizon of the graph. 
That red line shows what all these other models think. There's a big uncertainty band. They think that's where we're headed. How do we compare? We're a little conservative. We see the, the three dots there. We're on the upper end, but within the band, because we don't think we should assume strengthening of policies. We have a $5 carbon price. Why? A quarter of the world's emissions has a carbon price on it right now. About 20 bucks. Average it out, that's about $5. But we're assuming it doesn't get any stronger. It's not going up to 10 until others like to assume, hey, it's going to happen. Because at the same time as carbon price could go up, guess what's happening to fossil fuel subsidies on the other side are also going up. So we said, all right. We're not going to assume strengthening. And so we're a little bit on the conservative end. So know that we, the baseline you're working with is a reasonable starting point for model experimentation. We are not a forecast shop. We are a learning shop. We want you to learn and decision makers to learn what are the high leverage actions to create in the future that you really want to see. There's our baseline. So back here to where we were with the model, okay, let me make it nice and big. Here we were, greenhouse gas net emissions. Why? Why is that going up? What is the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions? Fossil fuel combustion, burning coal, oil, and gas is the biggest source. Why is that? And one note. I'm asking a lot of these whys, whys, whys. I want to get us start to focus on root cause drivers. And the perspectives that I really like is an alternative to a view where we just look at events. What are the events, what are the headlines you hear on climate solutions these days? What do people talk about? What's up with climate? What do you, what do you hear? Just call out, yeah. Say it again. Net zero. net zero. Yeah, we just need to get to net zero. What else do you hear in headlines about climate solutions and new the new green deal as a suite of policies here in the United States? What else? Pardon? What, what? what is a silver bullet? Carbon capture. carbon capture. Carbon capture. Maybe we can grab the carbon dioxide at the end of the smokestack for gas and coal. Maybe we can make these machines, direct air capture machines that are like dehumidifiers that kind of pull it out of the atmosphere. What else? Uh, depending on the resources, climate change is a hoax. Maybe it's a hoax. <laughs> Maybe it is a way for guys like me to get rich. <laughs> exactly. So this is how we hear this conversation. And sometimes it's tempting to just say, let's react to whatever is the hot thing. The method of system dynamics says, under the waterline in this iceberg is what's really driving change. And the first perspective is patterns of behavior. What are the trends over time? You'll note, and long-term trends, the graphs I'm showing are 100 years long. This is not the next quarter or the next few years. This is a long period of time. We say, let's look at the trends. Where are things headed? Can we anticipate? But the gold, from our perspective, is systemic structure, root causes. What is really driving change? That answer to why, 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 when we say sea level rise, why? Temperature, why? Greenhouse gas net emissions, why? Combustion of fossil fuels. Now we're going to ask the next question in systemic structure, why? Why are we seeing those emissions going up? And there's a Japanese researcher named Kaya who came up with just such elegant math on the question of why carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels and energy is going up. And it just said, follow it from the left. People, global population, times GDP per capita, that is how much goods and services produced per person on Earth. Put the two together and you get global GDP. People, GDP per capita, together, global GDP. Third factor, carbon intensity of GDP, energy per unit GDP, and then how much emissions per unit energy. What a beautiful little equation, huh? That gives you CO2 emissions from energy. So let's take the Y all the way back here 
to the far left. Why? Why is population GDP per capita going up? Why is overall global GDP going up when you think of root cause drivers? Why? I'm going to argue from a systems perspective, the core driver is a feedback loop process. And we take that, we are looking for feedback loop processes, such as the growth of capital and industrialization around the world. Capital, factories, businesses, infrastructure, electric utilities, all is generating profit, reinvestment, more capital. More profit, more reinvestment, more capital. A reinforcing feedback loop over time. In the same way, what's the population reinforcing feedback loop that's been driving growth since the dawn of humans? More children have more children. More children become adults, more people, more births. More births, more people, more births, more people, more births, around and around. Two feedback loops that the industrialization one on GDP, population, are the core drivers. So when I say, what are the core drivers of change over time? I am talking about these, that is number one of the top 10 system structures driving climate and equity dynamics. Number one we just named, and it is reinforcing GDP growth. Look for that. When you try to understand what's going on in the model right now, one of the 10 things that will explain behavior to you is the fact that you have this core driver. More people, more industrialization, more energy demand, therefore more burning coal, oil, gas, more emissions, more concentration, more temperature, more sea level rise, Venice. That is the causal chain, okay? All right. That was number one, way over on the left. But look at the second effect from Kaya, really focused here, which was, let me pull up Kaya again, the energy intensity of GDP falling steeply over time. This is how much energy it takes to deliver a trillion dollars of goods and services. Yeah, yeah. As we shift from a manufacturing economy to service, but also stuff is just getting much more efficient over time. It's falling and falling and falling. And Amory Lovins, who lectures here, my first boss actually, uh, talks about this amazing revolution in energy efficiency. There it is, and we're anticipating it to continue as the energy intensity comes down and down and down. However, notice that's, that's like 80 years into the future. This is not a rapid process. And of course, the beauty of En-ROADS is that you're going to be able to change this. I haven't done that yet, have I? Let's, and well, all the way down the line, less population, more population, right? And economic growth, less or more. And you can change it at this basic level of words, low growth, high growth, keep it simple. Or if you want to roll up your sleeves and get into it, Deeper, you're going to look, click the three dots, and you're going to see, well, actually, they assumed 2.5% per year GDP growth in the near term, transitioning over 75 years to 1.5% per year. That's like doubling every like 30 years. That's like steep exponential growth, but you can change it. And you can say, that's crazy. It's going to be only one, and it's going to be two and then you get the GDP that you see there, and it does what it does to energy. And then you hit this button, and then it plays it three times because it's fun to see lines move around <laughs> with a little of software drama here. So my point, though, with this third factor is how long it seems to be taking. And if we improve the energy intensity of new stuff, so right now, new capital, is improving at 1.2% a year. The energy intensity is getting going down, 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 1.2% a year. Just the new stuff. If we imagined, what if, through amazing research here, you all are able to improve that improvement rate, increase it to say 3.2, then you're going to see the energy intensity fall faster. Now, 
in what decade do you see it really kicking in and you seeing big results? Can you squint your eyes and see that big enough? When does the energy intensity really start breaking away in a change that I made like next week? Yeah, it takes time. It takes a long time for those changes in the new stuff to be shown in the average and therefore in overall emissions. This is system structure number two. We call it capital stock turnover delays. This is the idea that when you bring in new stuff, it takes a long time for the average to change because the existing stuff has a long lifetime. Cars, motors, buildings, all this stuff is lasting like 10, 15, even longer those many years. So it takes a long time to get the old stuff out and the new stuff in. I talked about energy efficiency. This is gonna matter in electrification. There are 1.5 billion internal combustion engines on planet Earth. It's gonna take, even though it's great, we're all buying them like Californians and, and Norwegians now, but even if that happens more and more, it takes a long time to get the old internal combustion engines out and the new stuff in. This is even more relevant with energy supply infrastructure. And I'm explaining this stuff partly again. This is kind of cool structural stuff, but you're gonna play with a model in a minute and you're gonna be like, hey, I just cranked up the renewables, wind and solar. Why do we still have coal, right? I should, it just should just disappear. It's not gonna disappear. Cause once you buy it, it lives for like 30 years unless you shut it down. And I'm gonna let you shut it down. But the transition of energy takes a long time because of capital stock turnover delays. When things change slowly, ask yourself, I wonder if that's what's going on. Factor four, it's about carbon intensity. How much carbon dioxide gets emitted per unit of energy? See the carbon intensity of final energy. Is it going up, down, or flat? What do you see right there? Yeah, it's going down pretty steadily into the future. This is anticipated to happen. Why? What do you think are the factors of like why that would be going down in this baseline future? Renewable energy. The biggest news about carbon intensity that we anticipate, hasn't happened yet, but we anticipate is the growth of renewable energy. Let's go look and see uh, what we anticipate when it comes to, frankly, the best news we got in this field is the fact that this is what people expect to see. Renewable energy, wind and solar energy demand. <laughs> we thought we've seen a lot in like basically your lifetimes through here. Oh my God, it's been amazing. Have you seen so much? Wow. <laughs> this is what we're ex expecting, hoping for. We're hoping you figure out how to make a grid that can do this, siting and permitting that can do this. We're counting on this. Now, the question is why? Why is it growing like that? And why would we have the confidence that it might? And I'll just pause for a second again about how we compare to others. Look at that growth. Again, when it comes to building confidence in a model like that, you're gonna wanna know the people who have huge models that take a week to run, what do they say about where things are headed? This is a series from 2000 to 2100 for four models. GCAM out of the U US, Remind Magpie and Message Globium, two other models out of Austria and Potsdam Peak in Germany. And also the International Energy Agency right here, they think with the orange line, this is where things are headed. And of course, we wanna build our confidence. So we will say, what is En-ROADS? En-ROADS is in the middle-ish. Does that make En-ROADS right? Is it valid? No, no. Just builds our confidence a little bit. So this is the kind of test that we have to do to make sure that we're consistent with the literature. Back here, I was asking you, why, why? In the same way that I asked you before about population and GDP growth, what could be the structural driver of this? It's not economically feasible to have it. So it's going to be 
it's cheaper. It is cheaper. And that is a huge factor. Let's go look at how much cheaper. Click on the miniature graphs, one of my favorites, cost of electricity. Here's how much cheaper. There's a lot of lines on here. Look at the green one. The green one is the marginal cost of electricity for production from wind and solar. Can we give it up for the drop of 95%? Seriously, clap for this. This is like the best thing. Did you guys think this was gonna happen 30 years ago? No, we didn't think this was gonna happen. It really, they were right, it's here. This university helped. This is fantastic, it's dropping so much and it's getting cheaper than the black line of coal and natural gas. That's why we're getting so much more investment. So, and that is an event-based story. Like this happened, so this happened. I'm asking, what is the systemic structure? And you could gaze over my left shoulder at the third, on the list, it's economies of scale. The economies of scale story says, the more wind and solar you build, the more you figure out ways to do it more efficiently, cheaper, production efficiency, installation efficiency, supply chain efficiencies, all that, which brings the cost down more. The cheaper it is, the more you sell. Another reinforcing feedback loop that they call economies of scale. And in En-ROADS, we model that explicitly, and we have a factor called the progress ratio. The progress ratio, which you can change, says that every doubling of cumulative installed capacity drops the cost 20%. And one of the key things we do with the model is you think 20%, well, that's those industry people cooking the books, I don't believe it. So with many of these factors, you're gonna be able to go in here and say, uh, don't believe the height. Assumptions, go under here and under assumptions, many of the variables in the model you can change. And of course, we had to find good sources for all these parameters with the best available science, but you can change some. Down here, progress ratio, Here's that number. And these little triangles, you're gonna see, here's our source, Junginer et al., McDonald et al., those are the two sources. There's 0.8, which is one minus 0.8 is the 0.2, which is the progress ratio. And if it was faster, what would the line do if it was 0.7? Run your mental model. What would the line do if this was 0.7? If every, Doubling accumulative installed capacity got us a 30% drop in cost. What is that blue line on the right gonna do? Okay, here's the deal. You gotta like talk loudly. <laughs> Fierce for results, loud. What's it gonna do? Go up, yes, go up. Here we go, 0.7. It goes up, and I'm gonna hit it again. You can see, if that were the case, and we may be able to change that by more investment in learning and improvement, so then we get more renewable energy growth. Did you notice the, the green line came down a little bit more, it got cheaper. You sparked that reinforcing feedback loop a little bit more. This is the third systemic structure driving climate and equity dynamics economies of scale. Okay. By the way, another way we build confidence in the model is that we look really closely at the history. And here's that history that I was getting you to applaud for, such as the drop in the marginal cost of solar electricity, and then for the growth in wind and solar. This is, you notice, 1990 to 2020. We wanna compare against history. Start the model, see can we track what's been happening over the last 20 years? All right. Back to Kaya. Kaya was telling us that these were the three, the four factors, put them all together and you get CO2 emissions from energy. And so those are all the energy emissions, but what's underneath all the, those greenhouse gas emissions other than energy? This graph is the same as that greenhouse gas emissions graph, but now it's revealing in a stack graph what's underneath. 
land use CO2, deforestation, land degradation, bioenergy emissions are there. A, this big black area, fossil fuel CO2, above it, F gases, SF6 that was in Nike Air shoes until they figured that one out, HFCs, and then above it, methane, three big sources. And I'm telling you this because you're gonna be able to go in the model and change much, much of this. Food from animals driving that, food waste, overall waste, wastewater and landfills, but also what energy source is a big driver of methane? Natural gas. So you change the natural, ga natural gas and you will change that blue area. Nitrous oxide in fertilizer. So when you change deforestation, you change, you know, if you change food use, then you're not gonna have to grow as much food and therefore less fertilizer and N2O. Those are all the big drivers that get us here in the baseline. Okay, so if this is the baseline, what you're going to be doing is creating the future that you actually want to see other than this. So I'm gonna start with the first factor. Oh, actually we can't, can't do that yet. We have one more thing that's in the model that I haven't shown you yet. And it really doesn't make a lot of sense that GDP growth is doing this, right, in the model. What did I say, one and a half percent a year? No, two and a half percent a year, one and a half percent a year. Hold simultaneously that fact of exponential growth where everyone's getting richer and richer everywhere around the world. Hold that simultaneously with this. How, do, how is the cognitive dissonance in the moment where you're like listing these things and thinking, okay, a third of Pakistan was underwater and what is gonna keep growing like the economists just say everything grows on earth. So that bugged us enough. Play with it, you'll see. At two degrees, we get a 17% drop in GDP. Two degrees, and that's already in here. And it's new. You guys who haven't used it last year, this is brand new that when, I'm gonna go pull up GDP and gross world product, here it is, and overall temperature over on the right. And under assumptions, we have economic impact of climate change. Right now it says, you see that? Climate change slows economic growth. You can see what the impact is by you say, well, I see that you use the economist Burke 2018's report. By the way, you can choose somebody else's. They're stronger ones, they're weaker ones. But if you say, you know what? We're fine. We're gonna keep growing like that, even if we have climate change, then you're gonna turn it off. Now run your mental model real quick. If that feedback loop were not there, we don't have a 17% drop at two degrees, how much higher is temperature? We don't have a slowing of economic growth. We don't have a slowing of, G of energy demand. We don't have a slowing of burning coal, oil, and gas emissions, concentrations. Temperature would be higher. How much? Hold up your fingers. One, two, three. These would be like 0.1. It would go to 3.4. 0.2, or yeah, 0.2 degrees up would be up to 3.5. 0.3 would be 3.6. 3.7, 3.8, 3.9. Hold up your hand, and you gotta put your butt on the line. Just hold up your hand. 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. 1.0, oh, she says. That would be a big effect. There's a 1.0 in the back, 10 of them. Okay, what you're doing, by the way, this is the purpose of this model. It's not a forecasting tool, it is a thinking tool. You gotta simulate your mental model before your computer model, or you don't learn anything. So when you're with your group and you're about to change something, don't just move stuff around. Think, I think it's gonna do this, or you don't learn. Okay, here we go. Climate change slows economic impact. It's off. The answer is 0 0.3, 0 0.3. And there is that impact. You'll notice at some point you're gonna change things. This feedback loop is a balancing loop. Temperature goes up, growth goes down. 
That's a pressure that brings temperature down even more as it feeds back. Remember those other ones I was talking about were reinforcing loops. There are other global feedbacks, and that's what we're talking about here, of course. One global feedback is the damage function I just told you about. The others that are here, I showed you before crop yield. Remember I showed you maize coming down 18%? Crop yield comes down. If we don't have our crop yield improving quite as much, we have to deforest more in order to feed all the people heading towards 11 billion people on earth. Therefore, that is a reinforcing feedback loop. Some of them we call tipping points, irreversible modes that our overall climate system could go into that frankly don't think much about that. There's, there's not a lot of juice in that cup. But understand some of these feedbacks are in the model. The crop yield one, uh, you can change permafrost release. People are nodding about permafrost, so you can say, I think there's gonna be more permafrost release of, carb of methane and carbon dioxide, or there's going to be less. There's an albedo effect, which is melting of the polar ice cap leads to more warming. So those are in the model, and you can turn some of them to be stronger or weaker. But when I say they're top 10 system structures to understanding climate and equity, number four is definitely getting your hand on, head around, global feedbacks and tipping points. Okay, now we're done with the baseline and let's go, let's go make things better. One of the better ideas, or one of the ideas for making things better that comes up a lot, we're gonna have as our first test. Anyone hear about this news about fusion? Last year? Yeah, yeah, okay. Nuclear fusion reactor smashes energy record, pushes plasma to a record breaking 100 million degrees. And you can imagine the whole like climate world had just a gleeful couple days. <laughs> it could be a silver bullet and it's just around the corner in Forbes. I gotta be less mocking as I say all this to set you up. <laughs> Maybe it will. Okay, can it generate unlimited emissions-free energy being from to Forbes? Could it do all that? So I'd like you to think. Here we have this baseline scenario that I laid out for all of you. And here it is. Because down here at the bottom, of course, are all the things that we can change that are policies. One of them is, let's imagine that there is Fusion, cheaper than coal. It's gonna to have to commercialize over time. It's gonna compete with coal, oil, and gas, but it's inexpensive. Here it comes. So think, how much will temperature go down? You're gonna hold up one, two, three, four, five, ten fingers for one, ten fingers would be one degree. So that would go down from 3.3 all the way down to 2.3, or maybe to 1.5. Think of your number, turn to the person next to you and say, I'm about to hold up two fingers or 10 fingers or 12 fingers. Tell the person next to you what you think the impact will be on temperature from fusion showing up next Tuesday. <laughs> Out of the lab. Okay, time to put your butt on the line. Hands, five, four, three, two, one, and up, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.3, 1.0, 0. 0.3, 0. 0.2, 0. 0.2. These guys have seen it before. 0. 0.5, 0. 0.3, 1.0, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.2, 0. 0.5, all right. You have simulated your mental model. Here it comes, new zero carbon energy, and boom! Point one. Now you think, okay, I know your first thought is, this guy hates fusion and he cooked the books, <laughs> right? Did it grow? Let's go look. And again, go look for graphs, primary energy demand, primary energy types, new zero carbon, primary energy demand. It grew faster than anything has ever grown in the history of energy supplies, it really grew. And yet, what decade did it grow in? 
Yeah, it takes a long time to commercialize new technologies. So there are those delays that leads it to when does it help in what decade? What decade does it succeed at the urgent task of reducing greenhouse gas net emissions? Yeah, it's like the 2050s and the 2060s. And just to note, uh, I'm going over to Dubai in a few months because we are trying to strengthen these pledges to the Paris Agreement. And to the pledges in the Paris Agreement for us around the world to follow, excuse me, those pledges, we would hit the red line. This is, and this is not enough when it comes to the speed and scale of de decrease of emissions uh, to hit the red line. That is when it really helps. So the first reason is that it's just delayed. And I didn't even put that in here. It's just such a challenging factor of complex systems is the long delays in them and the effect of those delays. That's one of the factors. Now note, why did it help? Why it helped is, well, and just note, the world doesn't need wind and solar. It doesn't need zero carbon energy or nuclear or clean energy. The climate doesn't need it. It needs to stop burning coal, oil, and gas. So it's only the ability of these new technologies to what we call crowd out coal, in this case, coal and gas. Crowding out. How much crowding out did we do? Go look. There's coal. Well, it kept a lot of coal from being burned eventually. And how did it do with natural gas? Let's go see. It crowded out natural gas. It is very successful at that, but it takes a long time. But this is the dynamic of crowding out that you're going to see when you look into the model, crowding out here and there between various sources. Okay, what else is going on? What does this do to energy costs? Why does it, it, it spreads around the world, why? It's cheap, it's cheap. If it's cheap, how cheap is it? Let's go look at the cost of energy. Oh yeah, it's cheap. Fantastic, fantastic, it's cheap. There's cheap energy around the world, but what does that do for the incentive for energy efficiency and conservation? Yeah, I wish it weren't true. I don't like it. And yet there is a connection between energy consumption and energy price. We call this the price demand feedback loop. Price demand feedback. When you notice something's funny with the behavior, look around and see, hey, did I make energy really cheap? Energy demand up. Did I make it really expensive? Energy demand's gonna go down because of energy efficiency. That's another important feedback loop driving climate and equity dynamics. All right, other dynamics here in the model, and in particular, driving what's going on in the carbon part of the model. And I, I'm gonna pull up here overall emissions and removals. You see that red line are carbon dioxide emissions. And I'm just gonna move a couple things to make it nice and flat. If we had energy efficiency, if you notice now from 2030 and on, that red line is fairly flat. If the emissions, the amount of CO2 we put in the atmosphere is flat, I'd like you to also think about CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Because concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere is like a bathtub. That is, when you hear about parts per million, the goal of 450 parts per million, 350 parts per million, it is the concentration, like right in front of us, right here, CO2 in the atmosphere. It's like a bathtub. The inflow is what? The faucet is what? This is, these are the emissions and it's flowing in. This is units per year, gigatons per year. This is gigatons total. Flowing out, what's that? Yeah, and I'm gonna call it net removals because it's such a flux back and forth. 
CO2 in the atmosphere. If emissions are flat, what should CO2 in the atmosphere, what seems like right it ought to be what shape? Make your arm do the shape of what CO2 in the atmosphere is going. Up, up, up. You guys are good, wow. I have only one flat, there's like nine up, one flat. I have to admit, I kind of try to trick people sometimes. Have you notice that? It's not nice, but it makes for good drama and you didn't fall for it. Yeah, you'd think it would be flat, but like you just noted, CO2 in the atmosphere, the CO2 concentration is still, even when it's flat, it's going up. And I want you to understand why, because it's gonna matter when you notice your results on carbon and also on temperature. We're, now to the, we're out of the energy world and the land world. We are in atmospheric chemistry here, okay? Over here about how the global flows work. And the story is emissions are about double removals. The red line, is the emissions. The blue line are those net removals. We have a bathtub where we're putting in double what we're taking out every year. That's why concentration is going up. What do emissions and removals need to be in order to have concentration flat? Equal. equal. God, I love how loud someone, loudly someone said that. They would need to be equal. They would need to be equal. That is the nature of the bathtub, and it is one of the most tricky components of this problem. Sulfur dioxide doesn't behave like this. Nitrous oxide doesn't behave like this. Lead in our paint and in the world doesn't behave like this. H all these other, uh, methane doesn't behave like this. The long lifetime of carbon dioxide makes it such that the first thing you said for solutions, net zero. As you know, and I'm not gonna create it now, you're gonna have created it on your own. That's why we have to get those emissions down, 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 like that-ish. Oh, did I just give you a secret? No, I didn't. I'm not gonna give you the answer. So, the carbon bathtub is yet another one of the important systemic structures driving behavior over time. Okay, what else do you wanna test? I gave you one big policy test, now it's time to test other things that show you which graphs to look at, what assumptions are behind it, et cetera, so that you can get through the last three of the structural dynamics. So call it out. What are other things that you see here that you'd like me to show you before you go do it yourself? Carbon removal. Carbon removal. What's the deal with carbon removal? What else? Carbon pricing. Methane who? Methane. I heard another one. Pardon? Bioenergy. Bioenergy. What else? Electrification. Electrification. Solar geoengineering, solar geo and radiation, solar radiation management. It's not in here. <laughs> but it is in our other model because, yeah, they're talking about it. But uh, not in this model. Um, okay, well, let's try some of these. And I want to focus... And now we're, I'm not gonna give you the answers to this because this is what you're gonna be doing, right? You're gonna go test all this stuff yourself. But I need you to see a few more things about how the model works. So carbon pricing. Under here, you're gonna be able to set, as you can imagine, any carbon price over time, ramp it, flatten it, whatever you like, and you're gonna be able to change it. One of the things I want you to notice about carbon pricing will be some of the equity concerns related to carbon pricing and some of the equity benefits. So carbon pricing, I'm gonna crank up the carbon price for a second without getting into it too, too much. Let's go look at coal and let's go look at 
overall air quality, air quality, PM 2.5 emissions, responsible in one in 10 deaths on earth, it's implicated by air quality. Some of these cities you've been to, what are the cities you've seen where air quality is really bad? Beijing, Delhi, et cetera, okay. And air quality disproportionately affects people in marginalized areas and communities. It is an equity problem. As such, can we do better? So with carbon price, watch to notice in particular the dynamics of a super high carbon price that takes coal out because of the high carbon density of coal which leads to air PM 2.5 emissions falling. In what decade does it fall when we set up a carbon price soon? Now. now, now. It is remarkable how soon medical costs drop, et cetera, many benefits. And it's important to note, this is one of these beautiful situations where we can do what our organization's co-founder, Dr. Beth Sawin calls multi-solving, multi-solving. We don't have the time to pick up policies that only fix one thing when there are many things we need to fix. Actions that cut coal both will change temperature for the climate and health and equity and fairness. We call that multi-solving, multi-solving. Go look it up. She's got a whole organization built around it. Two others to look at. Food. Food and the interdependence of food. When and where it hides under deforestation. Notice under here. Here we have, and you're going to be able to look at deforestation. Deforestation and over here, methane. Some of the other impacts. Underneath, Look and hit the three dots because food from animals, food waste. We don't have to grow as much crops to feed animals. If we don't have to grow as much crops, we don't have to convert forests into agricultural land, therefore less deforestation. Less cattle, not as much meat, more dairy, means less methane. If we don't grow as much of all this crops, then we also get to cut methane emissions. If we do all of that, we retain more trees in the world and go look. Remember we were looking at the bathtub at removals. We don't chop the trees down. Natural carbon removal is called not chopping the trees down. So they stick around and continue through photosynthesis to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Those two factors I would call forests and land stocks and flows and that food interdependence. Okay, what did I tell you? I told you I was gonna show you around the model so you can now kinda get going. Some tricks that I'll show you. Did you know that you can go up here, share your scenario, copy a link, and email it to someone else? He's like, oh, hey team, I've got a scenario I like, here it is. You can send them the entire scenario like a Google map address right there or post it on, does it say Twitter? What's Twitter? <laughs> um, you can also uh, copy data to clipboard, grab it, throw it in Excel, make your own fantastic new graph. You can go see a summary of everything that you have done in your scenario right here. Under here, you can go and look at all the equations in the model and the model diagram, and you're gonna nerd out on terrestrial all the stuff that's in there and you want to see the stocks and flows, it's all there. And you can go look at the user guide, which has a lot of tips. And if you really get into it, we shot 63 videos to do exactly what I'm doing right now because it ain't rocket science. It just ain't rocket science. You could do it. Go study that if you really want to go learn much more about it. The, last th the first thing I told you, set you up with the model, point you at the core top 10 drivers of change over time. The top 10 systemic structures. When you get stuck playing with the model, you're gonna say, I wonder if it's one of those 10 things that Drew told me about. They're right there. 
And I hope right now, having seen these trends, you are even more fierce for justice, fierce for results. Okay. Okay. Thank you.